Hello and welcome to the Dr. APJ Abdul Kalam Memorial Lecture organized by Dr. Kalam Center. You know, our topic today is a very special one. Today we are going to talk about our place in space, right? So what's our place in space? That's what we're going to talk about today. You know what? Thousands of years ago, humans uh, looked into the skies and, uh, and wondered what were those shiny little dots in the night shroud of blackness. And they wondered and they kept wondering. Till only about a hundred years ago, we actually understood some intricacies of this recipe called the universe. And our experience has indeed been magnifying and also very humbling. Today, we're going to discuss all such experiences of humankind's quest into space with somebody who's actually been in space. And that person is none other than astronaut Sunita Williams. Now, as you all know, Sunita Williams uh, was born in the year 1961. She started her career as a Navy, U.S. Navy pilot. She uh, has done uh, about 321 days in uh, space, which is called the space time. And of that, more than 50 hours, she's done something which we call spacewalk. And she's going to discuss about her space time and spacewalk and all the experience in between and her career itself. And she's going to take some questions from you as well. All that is going to happen. But before that happens, if you're joining us from India, I have a special news because Sunita Williams also shares a connection with India. Yes. Her father's side, her father's side of the family, her father was a doctor. He hails from a place called Mehsana in Gujarat, you know, Western India. Mehsana is a district and she hails, her family hails from there. Now, uh, you know, over the past uh, 10 days or so, we have run the What's That Star quiz series. Some of you have answered uh, and participated regularly. Some, you know, people who had participated have been selected to ask questions here. Some of you had uh, posted your questions with the hashtag Ask Williams, something which campaign which we ran. Some of you have been selected to ask questions from there as well. But in case, in case you did not, uh, you know, participate in either of them, you still have a chance right now. Yes. You can go to the comment section as we are discussing and you can post your question as we discuss. Now, some of those questions, depending on how good your question is, how unique it is, uh, we would be in a position to take it on air. So your question will be displayed on the screen and I will pose it to astronaut Sunita Williams. Hi, I'm NASA astronaut Sunny Williams. I'm so excited to join the Kalam Center to talk to all of you about our place in space. And now I'm not going to take any more time of yours, and I'm going to straight away invite our guest for this day, uh, Sunita Williams, the astronaut. Welcome, ma'am. Well, thank you so much for inviting me to uh, the Kalam Center. I'm just uh, so honored to be here and be with everybody in India. So I know people are uh, tuning in from all over, and I appreciate uh, everybody's uh, willingness to uh, to hear a couple words and of our discussion about uh, what's going on in space. 
Uh, absolutely. There are thousands of uh, young children who have enlisted and enrolled and have asked several questions. We'll take some of them as well. But I think the inspiration which you provide, uh, you know, with all the, or oh, you almost completed one whole year in space. That inspiration is so good. But I want to actually start from the very beginning because a lot of children are joining us. And I was just wondering at what point, what did you want to become when you were a child growing up? Uh, and then when did this astronaut dream come to you? Yeah, it's an interesting question and it's an interesting story. Um, my path was not really quite straight to becoming an an astronaut. I, you know, I grew up in a in a household with uh, my dad, who immigrated from India, and uh, got went through medical school in India, and then came to the United States and um, did his residency and became a doctor and a research researcher here. Uh, my mom is from very humble beginnings in Ohio. She's Slovenian descent. Um, she didn't ever even have the opportunity to go to college, but she made her way um, as an X-ray technician, and um, so I think. We saw my brother, my sister, and myself, a lot of hard work from my parents, and we all knew that we should work hard. You know, that was sort of the, the mantra of the family. We all were athletes as well, and um, and what I liked the most when I was a kid was swimming, because I was an athlete, and I liked uh, animals, and so I really wanted to be a veterinarian, uh, sort of following my dad's footsteps as in the medical field. Um, but honestly, when I applied to colleges that I thought I had to go to to do to fulfill that dream, I didn't get into the universities that I thought I had to. And under the guidance or recommendation of my big brother, um, he said, "Why don't you think about the Navy and the Naval Academy?" And uh, you know, money is tight, and money's tight everywhere. And uh, that also provided a, a, a free education. And I thought, well, why not do this and see how it goes. So I joined the Naval Academy in the Navy, and I became a, um, a pilot. Again, wasn't my first choice. Uh, I wanted to be a diver because I was a swimmer. Um, mm -hmm. But I got my second choice again, and I wanted to be a jet pilot, but I didn't become a jet pilot. I became a helicopter pilot, again, a second choice. So, you know, one could think, oh, my God, your life is not going the way you want it, but uh, somehow that opened the door to going to test pilot school, which opened the door to becoming thinking, you know, for the first time in my life when I was in my mid 20s, considering like, wow, I could actually be an astronaut because I've, I've, I've done some checks and I didn't even realize it. And I knew I needed to get a further education to make myself competitive. And I, then I started to look at what I needed to do to become an astronaut. So it was not a straight path. It was very circuitous, but again, family um, hard work and uh, just looking at new opportunities, I think, was really the, the key to that and an understanding that, you know, what you know at 17 is really not everything. <laughs> There's a lot more in the first Sometimes second choices are good. You know, second choices, uh, it's, it's okay to not get your first choice all the time. Exactly. I think that's a, that's a great lesson for all the kids who've got their board results in India. You know, sometimes you don't get what you wanted, but you get towards what you actually want in life. So that's great. And I just wanted to know, you know, so you, you got the first inspiration around mid-20s that you could probably go to space. And when was the first time you actually stepped into, uh, you know, a, a rocket or, or the space shuttle? What was your feeling? How were you feeling that I'm going to space for the first time? And when you yeah. entered into space, what was the feeling? This is a very another interesting question because, um, you know, when people look at our resumes, they go, oh, wow, everything sort of worked out and was perfect. Um, you know, I uh, came to NASA in 1998, and I flew in two, end of 2006. Um, and in the meantime, after I was assigned to a, a shuttle flight uh, to go to the International Space Station in 2002, but unfortunately the Columbia accident happened in two, early 2003. And, uh, you know, of course we lost our friends, including Kalpana Chavla, put a big stop on the shuttle program. We didn't really know if we were going to go to space anymore on the shuttle. We knew we had this great partnership with the Russians, so that would happen. But, you know, it made me stop and think for a moment. You know, I, I might be here and I'm contributing, but I may never go to space. And honestly, when we, after the investigation and we decided we were going to go back to space again on the shuttle, and it was our turn, our my shuttle crew's opportunity to go and train and start doing things, it still felt like a little bit of a dream. And even going out to the launch pad on launch day, you know, it's amazing. You stand there and there's the shuttle who's all fueled up and it's like alive itself. And you're walking out there and you're like, wow. 
but it didn't feel like we were going to go to space. It just felt like a really amazing engineering project sitting there. We get into the spacecraft and it felt like a simulator that we had done a number of times. And again, it didn't feel real. Not until the main engines lit. <laughs> Six seconds before liftoff. And then the, you know, the solid rocket boosters lit and then we started rumbling and going. And then um, there was three rookies on my flight and we just started laughing and cracking up. We we're like, oh my God, we're actually going to space. This is crazy. <laughs> so, um, you know, it's pretty surreal uh, actually going through that whole process because we're used to things on Earth, but we're not used to jumping off the planet. And, uh, you know, getting yourself to that point, I think actually you just have to be prepared as, as you can be, but it's going to be a surprise. It's the first time is just amazing. Yeah, absolutely. And then when you uh, docked with ISS, and you would have looked out of the window sometime and you would have looked at Earth. How did it feel like? You know, you've just left this planet. Yeah, it was in pretty incredible. Um, our, uh, you know, when we get to space, it only takes, you know, uh, you know, 10 minutes or so, a little less than 10 minutes to actually get to the place where you're floating and orbiting around the planet in, in whatever spacecraft. Um, and uh, our commander said, Sonny, come on, come on up here. You know, uh, I want, to, want you to come up and see, see what's going on because I was down on the mid deck. So I float up the stairs and he puts my little astronaut wings on and I look out the window and I see the earth and I'm like, oh my God, it was incredible. Of course it's round, you know, <laughs> it's curved like we are learning in school, but aside for that, it was just so peaceful and serene and just, we are, you know, floating over. I, I can't remember exactly where at the time, um, the other side of the earth. And it was just in, just incredible blues and whites. I mean, I, I I don't really remember exactly what part of the Earth. I just remember the colors and how mm. beautiful our planet is. And just looking down there, just hard to really switch yourself back into going back to work because it was just incredible, just amazing. And did you, did you see the oneness of the planet? You know that you don't see any boundaries when you go to space. It, it all oh. seems one. Without without a doubt, like I was mentioning, I don't remember exactly where like i can't geographically tell you exactly where because i didn't even think about it as that i thought about it more as look at this amazing planet we're flying over and this spectacular view and this perspective where we are really makes us makes you feel like you know this is one earth that we have that's all we have and we're just people and plants and animals on this one piece of rock in the universe here and we should really uh, be taking care of ourselves and taking care of each other and taking care of our planet. Absolutely. And, and you spent almost one whole year in space, uh, in, mostly in ISS, or almost in all in ISS. So I'm just wondering, you know, how does this schedule look like? Do you follow the clock of the Earth? Do you wake up like 7 a.m. and 24 hours pass? All that, is that significance to you? Or, or it's just you follow your own clock? And uh, on, what's your schedule like? What do you do usually? Yeah, yeah. The schedule on board is pretty much like it is on Earth. We want to keep it. As, as similar as possible. That's, I think, the way people are most productive because we've done this for so many years. We wake up in the morning and burst our teeth, wash our face, just like we do, you know, on, on Earth. Um, somewhere around six o'clock, we use um, Greenwich Mean Time. So, you know, time in uh, in Europe, essentially. There's a couple reasons for that. Uh, it allows a half a normal day for our flight controllers, the people in mission control in Houston, and half a normal day for the flight controllers in Moscow and, and a normal day for the flight controllers in Europe. Unfortunately, our Japanese counterparts get the bad shift on the other side of the planet. Um, but at least for most of the programs, it's a normal day. And for us, that's a normal day. We wake up around 6.30, 7 o'clock in the morning. You know, like I said, brush our teeth, wash our face, start the day, get going. Um, just like yesterday, there was a spacewalk. So the first part of the day is getting prepped and getting ready for the spacewalk. The second part of the day is doing the spacewalk. But we could be doing experiments. We could be doing maintenance. Uh, we could be setting up an internet system. We could be fixing the toilet. Um, we could be uh, practicing uh, for a robotic uh, arm operation when some, one of the visiting vehicles come. You know, there's a myriad of things we can be doing. And every day has a bunch of different little tasks. We generally eat lunch by ourselves, you know, like everybody like grab something to eat. And then, um, however, at dinner time, we, we gather all back together. Uh, we usually have a planning conference with all the mission control centers that I mentioned earlier around the Earth. 
tests around the planet, uh, just to talk about the tests that we've done and the tasks that we have to do tomorrow and make a plan. And uh, and then I usually just turned on some type of uh, TV show that was a little bit relaxing uh, that we all could watch together, maybe a cooking show or something fun like that. Uh, so right. I'm sure cooking sports. There's, there's no cooking which happens in space. No, there's no cooking, but you can be creative. Um, so we don't really have, uh, you know, all the machines to cook and stuff like that, but we have the food that's already ready made. But it's fun to sort of mix, try to mix things together. It's hard to hold them all together and, and eat. But like, for example, I had a bag of uh, Indian food and, you know, Indian food is generally pretty spicy. So right. you want to eat it with rice or with bread. So that that act of trying to put those two things together in space is a little bit tricky. So um, we try to try to do that and, you know, and figure that stuff out. That's as much of cooking as we can do, but, <laughs> but, it, but <laughs> we, we make do and make it. And then do you like get any spare time to do any activity like your hobby or anything or is it always a practice? No, absolutely. You know, there's spare time in the evening and we really try to do that to allow people to have a little bit of, downtime to do what you want to do. For example, I wrote a journal when I was up there. A lot of people become very good at photography, of course, because we were taking pictures of our planet yeah. and, out, and like the picture behind you out into the universe, just amazing pictures. Um, people like, you know, we always work out. We, have, we all have to work out every day for a couple hours, a little bit of weight resistive training to make sure our bones density is good. And then cardiovascular to make sure our, our cardiovascular system is working properly. Um, some people like to do a little bit more working out, for example, or, or some people like to, um, you know, do projects on the computer. It's all, and also, of course, one of the most things that people do is get in touch with people back at home. So we have an internet protocol phone that we can make phone calls back to home. We have a video conferencing capability that we could see people back at home. So uh, a lot of people try to stay connected. Right. So, and you get good internet there, do you? I'm sorry? Do we get good internet? Unfortunately, we don't have internet up there. Um, well, oh. we do. I, I, let me take that back. We do, but it's pretty slow because it has to come through uh, the internet here at Johnson Space Center. And so um, there's a little bit of delay in it. But, you know, if you really wanted to and you're patient, like old-time dial-up, um, you could, you know, order your friends and family a gift from space if you really wanted to. Well, you could. <laughs> <laughs> and you can pay from space as well. I'm sorry? You can, you can pay from space as well. You can, you can pay from your uh, card. I think you probably have to have it already set up. <laughs> did, did you manage to do that? Did you send something? I didn't. You know, honestly, I didn't. I know. I just know some folks had. Uh, I would generally, if I wanted to give something to somebody when I was from in space, it was generally a picture. Um, I, I was. Uh, I would draw birthday cards. I, I like using um, colored pencils, and I brought colored pencils. And one of my favorite things to do is draw. And uh, so I would draw birthday cards for people. So I was trying to maintain a good list of birthdays and so I could draw them birthday cards and then send them down a picture of their for their birthday. Nice. I, I remember one of the things that you did, I remember hearing is that you ran a marathon in space. Uh, <laughs> so I was just wondering, how, does it feel the same when you run in space on a treadmill or whatever that is? Uh, does it yeah. feel the same when you, you fly off? Like, uh, there's, um, there's commonalities and differences. So you can get a really good uh, cardiovascular workout uh, on the treadmill, just like you can here on Earth, right? If you really want to, you can do it. Um, on In space, though, we have a harness that goes over your shoulders, around your waist, and that holds you down at the waist points, checkpoints either side, holds you down to the treadmill. And the point there is, is every time you jump up to run, because usually, you know, one foot comes up, it will pull you back down again. So you're c continually feeling this pulling of, of you being pulled back down to the treadmill, which that's how you run. Uh, you can change the the length of those bungees to make it maybe a little bit less than you weigh or a little bit more than you weigh, depending on how much it's stretched. Um, uh, I, when I ran the marathon, I, would, I was a little bit less weight than I am right now, <laughs> and I made myself a little less weight. Uh, so it was a, a slight bit easier, but it is it is still, uh, you know, four and a half hours on a treadmill, um, which... Right. 
which ends up hurting your shoulders a little bit more and your in your hips a little bit more than you would run because of the pulling because down. Pulling Mm -hmm. right. But you still use the same leg muscles, so my, my thighs were pretty tired when I got done. One of the really good things, though, it's, it's microgravity, and if anybody's run a long distance run, the next day it hurts to sort of walk around because we still have all that lactic acid in your legs. Right. You didn't have to walk around in space, so all of that mm -hmm. pain went away really quickly for me, which was wonderful. You know, so I... I when I finished the marathon, for example, I said to myself, I'm not getting back on that thing. But by two days later, I was like, oh, I'm fine. I can get back. No problem. No problem. Great. And, and then I want to understand, you know, one of the uh, other assignments which you jumped, uh, about 50 hours you walked uh, in, in space itself, not in the space shuttle or not in the yeah. ISS, yeah. but out in space. Uh, when you stepped out of that little hatch for the first time, you were alone probably. How did it feel like stepping into space? Like, what do you see? What is that? You know, what's your feeling? Are you scared? Like, what happens? Uh, yeah, so you know, the, the process, like I quickly mentioned about the daily process, it, it takes a couple hours to get suited up. And part of that is just getting ready to go into that different pressure environment. We want to make sure that nobody gets the bends from, you know, nitrogen bubbles. And so you're actually in the suit for quite some time to get ready to go out. Um, and so, it's more of a routine because it's the process of getting dressed. And so finally, when you feel like the hatch is open, you're like, oh, good. It's time to get to work. <laughs> you know, and then that's how I felt like it was dark when, because of course, we go around the earth every hour and a half. And so 45 minutes is daytime and 45 minutes is light, um, nighttime. So when we opened up the hatch, it was nighttime. So I turned on my lights on my suit, went outside and just started went to work right away. But then as the sun came up and I could see the earth moving below me, I mean, I think my eyes probably got huge. I was like, oh, my God. Where, you know, like all of a sudden it dawns on you, like where you are and what you're doing. Because, um, you know, and again, I don't mean to minimize it, but we practice so much here. We have such a good training facility called the Neutral Buoyancy Lab that we're, we know the tasks that we're supposed to do. So we want to just get outside and start working on our tasks. Um, but like you said, when as soon as the environment really presents itself with the sunrise here it's a little bit shocking you know and i had to remind myself like sunny stop looking down at the earth just get get back to work <laughs> yeah just it's incredible and then on my first spacewalk we actually had some time um particularly at night because they were troubleshooting an issue and they said just hang out for a little while and and stay there and um we'll be back in about 10 minutes to tell you what to do so it was just a wonderful experience to look out into the universe at night. Mm -hmm. And uh, we actually flew over an area of Earth that had the the, the aurora at the same time, huh? oh, yeah. Canada, and so it was the northern lights. And to see all those, uh, that green, you know, motion below you for the first time was just uh, breathtaking. And it really, you know, back to the whole point about the oneness reminds you of where you are and how our earth is just part of a bigger universe that has a lot of energy and other things that we can't even think and imagine how to really tap into. It's just, it was just incredible. Um, so what an amazing experience and only to have your visor between you and it. I mean, really, it was like, mm -hmm. wow, this is pretty crazy. <laughs> And what was your, uh, you know, when you, obviously you're doing something absolutely new there, would have been something which is funny, right? Is, is there something happened to you which was really funny while you were yeah. in space? Oh, you, like, well, a lot of things are very funny. You know, like it's just, you have to pinch yourself to remind, you know, sometimes you get into this daily routine, right? And you're like, oh, you know, I got to, you know, I got to go, you know, fix the toilet today or I got to, you know, like vacuum. And then all of a sudden you can, while well, you're working on something and you're having a hard time getting there, you can immediately turn yourself upside down and the whole thing looks different and it's like oh okay now it's not so hard. that was pretty easy and you know you just i think laugh a little bit about like where you are um i remember we had a module that was uh sticking down below us and i was flying over it and it's like you know probably 25 feet deep and i was thinking to myself wow I don't even remember what it's like to walk because if I, if I was walking, I'd be really scared of this big, huge hole, but I just fly right over. We ended up having a bunch of um, bags. We usually see white bags in the space station 
at the bottom of that, if we were, we were uh, actually pushing ourselves down into the hole and then sort of bouncing off the bags and popping back up, which was pretty fun. Um, another funny thing I was, it, you can be in, in one of these weird modules that stick off the side or the top. It, it was flying down to the Russian segment and my uh, Yuri Malenchenko I was flying with at that time, he was hovering in one of the segments above me and I had no idea I'm looking for. Him. I'm like, Yuri, where are you? And then he comes above me and goes like that and scared the heck out of me. <laughs> so I do think the space station would be a good place to play hide and go seek because you can hide in all these no, different You can hide anywhere. You can actually be hiding in the ceiling. Yeah, yeah. It's, a, it's amazing. Yeah, yeah. So that's, that's a lot of fun. And also, I think probably people know about like different things. Like I had wasabi paste when I was up in space with me that. You don't think mm -hmm. about the things, the things on Earth fall to the ground, right? And I, there must have been a pressure differential, so I opened up the cap of this, this paste, you know, which is essentially the consistency of, you know, ketchup or something. And then when I opened it up, it just came shooting out at me, and so it's like shooting wasabi at, all over me. <laughs> you know, wasabi can be very hot, right? It's, it's very hot. Yeah, sauce. Yeah, yeah. So I didn't really didn't want it in my eyes, and it, I ended up getting it like on my sweatshirt. And stuff, and I tried to clean it off, but um, that smell stayed for a little while. And I and I remember seeing an interview where you talked about carrying samosas to space. Oh yeah, uh, yeah samosas, and they were gone pretty quick. You know, everybody wanted some of them, so unfortunately, uh, we only had a couple days to enjoy them. <laughs> <laughs> but do they taste different? Uh, when you eat uh, samosas in space, see? No, just, you know, um, we didn't really have a way to heat them up too much. So they were already cooked and already made. They're just, n you know, not as fresh, of course. But it's okay. It still tasted good. <laughs> yeah, Whatever you get there, I suppose. Yeah. And one of, in one of the interviews, in the same interview, actually, you, you also talked about uh, carrying a copy of Bhagavad Gita. Uh -huh. to, uh, so I was wondering, what inspiration uh, did you get from Bhagavad Gita? What was yeah, you know, it's interesting. Uh, um, my first flight, I, f I took the Bhagavad Gita with me and just a, a small version of it, you know, of course. Uh, and then uh, my second one, I took uh, Upanishad. And uh, my, these are both from my dad. Uh, you know, when we were young, he told us uh, all about the Bhagavad Gita stories. And so when I was up there, I said, you know, this is, I don't really want to read while I'm up in space because I can read when I'm on Earth. I want to, when I'm in space, I want to do stuff that is unique. And that's why I said, I'll bring this small book with me because that would give me inspiration. You know, every night I could read just a couple pages. And it was really, it was just really nice because it sort of puts life in perspective, you know, like what we're doing and why we're doing things. And, um, you know, and really what's the, what's the, what's our purpose? What's our meaning? And I think that was um, just, I think if you want to save it, you know, the trite word grounds you a little bit. So um, I think that was the, the best, a very wonderful present and gift from my father. Oh, absolutely, and it's from the father, so it's it's all the more important and precious, I suppose. Absolutely. And, you know, so we talk about Indian food, Indian uh, scripture. Have you visited India? You've visited India quite a few times. What's been your fondest memory? Uh, what's your most vivid memory of India? You know, it's it's funny you ask that, and I, you know, I've been to a lot of places in India. Of course, I have relatives in India, and I have really good friends in India. Um, and I, uh, I remember, I think, uh, I don't remember exactly where we we're going with, with my dad. My sister and I took a wonderful trip in 1998 and spent a couple of weeks with him there. And I think we were going to Mount Abu. But what I, and it wasn't really that getting there, which was important. It was uh, being at that, that, that place. But it was the travel on the way there. And I remember just driving through the Indian countryside, getting there. And seeing uh, temples with, with flags, colorful flags, and people this living a, a pretty simple and wonderful life. And I was, I remember this. I have this impression, like every time anybody asks me what do I think about India, that scene just comes to my head Im immediately. It was this, like in the middle of the countryside, this temple and these flags, They're a lot of color. Um, a second memory that comes to mind immediately is we stopped for tea. Uh, it's some little town, some small town, and there happened to be uh, a cow that was nearby where we were stopped for tea. And somebody mm -hmm. had put a whole bunch of little stones around the cow, 
to make sure that nobody would be too close to him, like on a bicycle or a, on a motorbike. And I was like, it, it left a really wonderful impression about this genuine caring for people, for animals in, in India. And I, I just, I think, too impressive. Yeah, yeah, you have to stop for chai. <laughs> and yes, you, have, you can find chai all the time. Uh, but India reminds me of wonderful colors, wonderful, caring people. That is um, my biggest impression from going to India. I'm glad. I'm, uh, India loves you, I can tell you that. That's for sure. I mean, we've been seeing that feedback. And it brings me, you know, your, uh, you know, India as a home. I want to take you from that side to the other side of uh, the time horizon. Uh, no, I've been working on astrobiology uh, quite a lot uh, in UK and also in India. And in fact, I wrote a book called Reignited 2, which uh, talked about astrobiology and what could be our next home. So I was just wondering, do you think, uh, you know, there's a whole lot of children who keep asking me this question as well. Do you think Mars is going to be our next home? And if yes, then when will that happen? Wow, that's, you know, that's a that's a tough question. You know, I I would love that we could go to Mars, that we, ne we need to take that trip. And uh, we'll learn so much along the way. You know, right now we have a program to get us back to the moon sustainably so we can learn how to live someplace different from our home. Because it's not, it's not like just moving from, you know, one town to another or one city to another or one country to another. It's, it's an entirely different place with an entirely different way of living because of resources all around you and atmosphere, of course. So what, how we would do that. So we need to practice with the Artemis program going to the moon and then take that next step to take people to Mars. Um, Mars 2020, which is a, 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 a another spacecraft that we're launching um, at the end of July, at the end of this month, beginning of August, will give us another small cue as to how we can get there, live there and work there. Um, but it will be difficult. It's, it won't be simple, and it will need a logistics train to allow us to be able to get there. And then it's going to take uh, a lot of creative thinking about how we could sustainably live someplace that far away from Earth. With the space station and the spacecraft that we fly, that we've flown, we can generally come back to Earth fairly easily. Um, <laughs> you know, but and, 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 going to, and going to the moon, we can come back to Earth fairly easily. Uh, but going to Mars is is really a lot trickier. Like when we go there, we have to be prepared to stay. For example, this this um, spacecraft that's going at the end of this month. I mean, we've waited till 2020 to launch it so that the planets are in the correct place so we can get there, right? So you can't just yeah. willy nilly at any time get to Mars. So it's gonna be it's gonna be a little bit tricky. I would love for us to go one because we the whole process of trying to get there and learning about it. We're going to learn so much. And then secondly, once we get there, it's really going to give us some insight as to what what was the situation with Mars. You know, was it habitable at one point in time? Are there living things there? What changes has that planet gone through to make it the way it is? And can we make it sustainable for us, maybe in some type of um, environment, some, some types of, um, uh, what do I want to say, like living space there? That'll take a, it'll take a lot of work. Um, but we're, we're destined to do that because we are explorers and we want to find out more about our own selves by going someplace else. So it's going to happen. And it just it will, it will be in our generation. I'm sure of it. Technology has changed so much and allowed so many new things to happen insofar as um, space radiation and propulsion. Those are things we're working on right now that can get us there. And I think it's going to happen. Oh, I'm sure because someday, I don't know, 400 years ago, man would have decided that how do I cross the Atlantic and go from all the way from Europe into the Americas? You know, so that same. You know, we we are a species which is known to you know challenge tough problems and win over it. And exactly. I think even now, I think the coronavirus crisis is going on. I'm very hopeful that you know we will win over it. It's, it's a challenge, and we've been used to winning over challenges. Which brings me to uh, this question that you know I've been hearing a lot about your future plans and then. How do you intend to do more spacewalks? Uh, so I just wanted to know what is the future plan? As you know, do you, do you intend to do uh, continue as an astronaut? Are you planning to do something else? Write a book, become a teacher? I think you can make a great teacher as well. By the way, so uh, what's your future? Plan? Going so in the immediate time frame, um, I'm going to fly in space. I hope, knock on wood, 
one more time uh, on the Boeing Starliner spacecraft, so a brand new spacecraft. So sort of the, the complementary uh, spacecraft of the of the SpaceX Dragon, which everybody saw recently yes, yes. fly uh, up to the International Space Station. So both companies, Boeing and SpaceX, were contracted to make brand new spacecraft to fly to the space station and take over low Earth orbit, as we call it, you know, going to the space station while um, NASA is working uh, on getting us back to the moon. So Boeing Starliner is my my spacecraft, um, and we're we're getting ready, hopefully, to launch an unmanned version of it this fall. Uh, first flight will be in next, hopefully, next spring, and then by the end of next year, I hope to be flying to the space station one more time. Um, and there at the space station, we're doing amazing new things too. Not only experiments on ourselves, but on genetics. Um, we're doing more spacewalks for new technologies, new solar panel technologies. We're putting up new solar arrays, as well as we just fin we're just finishing up putting new batteries up there. So um, all of this stuff is the next step um, and helping us further in our program. We're also developing a brand new spacesuit uh, for yeah. a, a uh, for a, a planetary suit for the moon. Um, I was I've been lucky enough to be part of that uh, development program the last couple of years and we'll be looking forward to a test flight of that spacesuit as well on the on this International Space Station. I may or may not be there to we'll see what happens, but um, I've been luckily I've been, been working on the development here on on Earth, which has been wonderful. Great. Uh, I heard that there are only four spacesuits available in the ISS. Generally, generally, there's only um, there's probably actually probably uh, a couple more, but they're not all put together. So we we generally have this thing called the hard upper torso, and there's only about ten to twelve of them in the in existence. Uh, and then we change out the arms and the legs, um, and of course we have a helmet as well. But uh, the, there's only a, a limited number of those hard upper torsos, and that has the meat, the brains in the front for the computer and then it has all the life support systems in the back and so there's uh, like i said there's only a couple of those the arms and legs we could switch around and we can make them longer or shorter depending on the person size ah, absolutely. and in fact even the iss is uh, running out of life i suppose we have to build a new iss or repair something like that 2024 i think was the uh, life expectancy of mm -hmm. that yes is, is, so we are, are we planning on a new iss as well or something so um we're planning on this thing called Gateway, which is like a much scaled down version of the ISS that will be closer into uh, the moon orbit. And so that way we could uh, put the lunar uh, lander on that uh, space station and easily get it down to the moon surface and back. That would be a place where uh, our spacecraft called Orion would dock to. Some folks would stay there, some folks would go down to the moon. And then at times that, that station might be left um, by itself and never come back to Earth until the next crew is ready to go back and, and continue on. So this is part of that logistics train that we would to build to be able to actually sustain ourselves on Mars. We have some spacecraft that would be orbiting Mars all the time too as sort of a jumping off point. So we're testing out all these concepts um, in the in the near future. So that's all underway. So the space program is alive and kicking. We've got, of course, the ISS, the Russian space program and the Soyuz, the Boeing Starliner, the SpaceX Dragon, Orion in Gateway. So it's there's a lot of work. It's a lot of fun. A lot of things to do. I think any youngsters uh, who are listening to this, uh, a lot of things to do for you. Yeah. So <laughs> yeah. what we're going to do, we, we'll take a quick break. And what we'll do in that break, we will play some of the clips uh, from yours, which you had made uh, in ISS, uh, things, how to eat and how the toilets work and everything else. So we'll take a quick break and then we'll return again. Okay. Thank you. Stay I know that there's some questions about how to use the bathroom and how do you actually live in space like normal like at home i mentioned real quickly about getting up in the morning and brushing your teeth and washing your face well how do you do that well here is the bathroom essentially you get up in the morning and we have a little kit and it has all the essential things that you need like your toothbrush and toothpaste and brush see how see how much better the brush makes my hair look <laughs> <laughs> I'm just joking. It still stands up straight. It doesn't matter where you are. It's always going to stand up straight while you're up in space. 
A lot of people ask about toothbrush and toothpaste. So luckily enough, toothpaste, you can do it upside right this way, is sticky and so it sticks to your toothbrush, no problem. Another cool thing is that water sticks to your toothbrush too. If you can see it, I'll have some water come out. And water is pretty neat up in space. It'll stick to your toothbrush and it will make a, whoop, a big bubble. And that's just by surface tension. This is our kitchen. You might notice there's all sorts of foods here. So that was a quick break we had, ma'am. Uh, and we are back again. Uh, just uh, now the next segment, uh, what we're going to do is uh, we're going to take some questions which have come from all around India and also uh, some countries outside uh, as well. So uh, I'm going to quickly start moving because there's so many questions, I tell you, even the comments are there, so the comments we'll also try to get. But some of the questions are common, so uh, just uh, nobody should feel lost because we'll take uh, the subject of your question anyways. But the first question comes all the way from Bangalore. And it's a young girl called Kashmi Hegre. And she's got, she wants to be an astronaut. And she's, uh, here's her question for you, right? Hello, ma'am. My name is Kashmi Hegre. I'm from Bangalore. I study in class three. My question is, when you do a spacewalk, how do you maintain your balance and move forward and backward? Thank you. So I, I, the, it's a little bit hard to hear exactly, but I think the question was during a spacewalk, how do you move forward and backwards? Yeah, how do, you, how do you figure it out? Because you can go all around. So how do yep. you maintain the balance and say this is forward and this is backward? Yeah, exactly. Great question. So here in, in Houston, in Johnson Space Center, we have a, a big pool, which we practice our spacewalks in to sort of get um, acquainted with what the space station looks like and where different parts are. For example, um, when you're in your house, you know, you don't have to tell yourself, go down the hall and take a right turn. When you go down the hall, you know that maybe there's a stuffed animal or maybe there's a television and at that or a door and you take a left. Same thing on the space station. We practice in this big pool and we notice that, hey, as I as I go forward, I know that there's an antenna or there's another module and that's where I'll have to take a left to get to the place that I'm going to work. On the outside of the space station, if you look at it, if you see pictures, you'll see yellow handrails that are about this long, so about a foot in length, and they're spaced out throughout the space station. So when we're moving along, we call it translating, we put a hand on the handrail, and we push ourselves to the next handrail. And then we grab the next handrail and push ourselves along, hand over hand over hand. So it's called space walking, but it's actually translating and actually using your arms. You use your arms a lot more than you use your legs. When you get to a place that you're going to work, though, sometimes we have a, thing, a boot plate where we can put our feet in and lock them into place. And that way, you can take your hands off and not hold those handrails, and then you can actually manipulate the tools or do the work that you need to do. You know, I will say that here in the pool, we still feel gravity. And so you know what is up and you know what is down. When you're in space, you can easily turn yourself around and get a little bit confused because there's no sensation of up or down. And so those physical cues, like I told you about in the beginning, like the antenna, or will really help orient where you are. So it takes a little bit of training, a little bit of mental discipline, and a lot of studying so you know exactly where you're going and what you're doing. And we do that through computer programs and like I mentioned at the point here. Great question. Right. Great, uh, that's a wonderful answer. And uh, what I wanted to move on was uh, to the next question, which comes from somebody in the music industry. Her name is Prajakta Shukri, and she's joining us from Mumbai. Hello, 
Hello, namaste. I am Prajakta Shukri. So my question to you is, uh, which kind of music did you listen to when you were in Spain? Also, I wanted to. I was just curious to know, other than our planet, uh, which planet interests you the most and why? Thank you. Oh, great, great, oops, great question. Um, so music, music in space is really important. It's so interesting because I think when you listen to music, it of course brings up memories of your life, right? It's particularly like, oh, or if you find a new song, you're like, oh, I really like that. But I think um, for me, it was mostly older music that reminded me of different stages of my life. So I would, we have a, a large selection of music. People brought music up, have brought music up there, uh, you know, digitally, and then we just save it. So we have a huge selection collection up there. Um, so I really liked, you know, like 70s and 80s and 90s music because it reminded me of um, good times when I was a, a younger person. And then also, uh, you know, some folks bring up some different music that I never had listened to before. Um, I like some classical music, but there was definitely a lot of uh, classical music. Some Russian music was up there and uh, just sort of wanted to expand the horizons. And when you're doing something like looking out the window, it's really an awesome thing to turn on some music. Or when you're working out on the exercise equipment, you can um, you listen to music. So I listened to stuff that I knew that I liked that brought back old memories, it was great. And then expanded my horizons with some of the music that the other astronauts and cosmonauts brought up. Um, my favorite planet beside for Earth, huh? Wow, that's an interesting question. Um, it, I think, I think Ju um, Jupiter. Um, You've see, we've seen pictures of Jupiter and time lapse a little bit about how its uh, atmosphere is moving. And it just, it seems very mysterious to me. Very, very cool. Not to mention the moons, the moons of Jupiter, um, that whole thing are, is awesome. And there's probably some oceans on the moons of Jupiter, which we are seriously thinking about exploring, working with you know, oceanographic institutions to build spacecraft that could uh, carry up um, uh, little like submarines that could pop through that ice and then go down and look at those oceans on the moon. And we, who knows what we'll find when we do that. So that's a whole nother field uh, that NASA and for example, Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution are working on together. So there's so much cool stuff out there and it's just the possibilities are unlimited. So I think that's why I love Jupiter so much. And I guess Jupiter also has an eye, you know, that yes, saw yeah. my eye. <laughs> right. So, so the next question is an eight-year-old uh, child who's asking a question all the way from Bangalore. Uh, her name is Vedita Chandra. Vedita, over to you. Hello, Sunita Williams, ma'am. Did you see any comet or asteroid in space? Oh, wow. So did we see any comets or asteroids? Uh, I'm trying to remember. Gosh, it's been a little while ago. Um, nothing that sticks out per se. And um, I know that there's, you know, of course, this comet that's flying that just flew by the, we've seen it visible here in the United States. Um, so nothing that I remember from my flights. But of course, when they, do, when they are in the vicinity of Earth, folks that are up on the International Space Station for sure can see them. So they have the opportunities just like we have on the ground, probably a, a number more opportunities because of how, how fast we go around our planet. So uh, you'll see it on one side of the planet, then you'll come back and see it again on the other side of the planet. Um, so yeah, those those opportunities are there. Unfortunately, yeah, for my flights, I don't think we had anything that it sticking, sticks out that I remember, but pretty awesome. Um, these things in the universe that really remind us about how small you know, we are and what a little insignificant part we are of it. Um, and we think we're so important here on Earth when we, when we are, but uh, we need to take care of our planet. That's what I think the biggest um, message there. Great. Uh, and next question comes uh, from uh, Dr. Ashok Patel, who's joining us from Stockholm. He's an educationist, 65 years old, and he's asking, how did you psychologically prepare for the space uh, since split second decisions are a matter of life and death? So how do you prepare yourself psychologically? What did you do? Oh, that's a, that's a great question. Um, so, you know, I think we try to prepare ourselves by just being here in this office and some of the training that we go through here. So I came from a military background, which has uh, also a flying background, which also requires 
some decision making fairly rapidly um, because aircraft and spacecraft are not quite forgiving, right? So that came a little bit in my background, but some folks come to the astronaut office without that background. So we, we train um, in different environments like this posters you see behind me, it's called NEMO. It's an underwater habitat where we go and live for a week or uh, two weeks at a time. Uh, we do some science. It's also uh, being encapsulated in a place. And it's also a, a habitable environment for human beings, of course, because you're living underwater. So you have to be very careful with your equipment. And so we, we try and practice by doing things like this. These are called analogs for space travel. Um, we also do a national outdoor leadership uh, courses. Um, some of that is to learn a little bit about yourself, like to answer the, that specific question. I, sh I need to know what things stress me out, what things cause me to have anxiety that maybe will prevent me from making good decisions. And when I understand those things, which we do on Knowles, we try to figure that out, then you have methods of how you contradict that or how you... Um, how you make sure that you can still think clearly through stressful situations. So we practice and we also talk about it. Uh, of course, there's a lot of experience in this office for the for many years. And so uh, we, we have lessons learned and we learn from the experienced folks and try to bring up the new folks and enlighten them to, or maybe try to en engage in them when some, to understand where some of those stressful points will come up and how you need to deal with it. Technologically, of course, we train. We train, we train, we train, and we know as much as we can about our spacecraft. And of course, we're tested. Um, so testing doesn't stop even when you're older. <laughs> and we're tested to make sure that we operate the equipment correctly. So it's a pretty thorough process. And you feel pretty confident. Oh, I'm sure it has to be the most one of the most complicated things to do. The next question comes from New Delhi. And uh, it's Dr. Piyush Kumar who's uh, asking this question. Namaste, Sunita Williams Ji. My name is Piyush Kumar. I'm based in Delhi. I just un I wanted to ask you a small question. That what do you think about Indians, young Indians, talent uh, about making their dent in the international space era? That is my question to you. Thank you. That's a wonderful question. You know, um, I've been to India a couple of times and talked to students and there's like so many students. And what I think, the thing that I uh, really, my impression there is, you know, one of India's biggest resources is its young generation of very smart, talented, creative um, people out there. And I think the contribution is huge in the Indian space uh, organization and your own space program in India. Um, I think if you can get involved as much as possible, there's so much to offer. There's so much to do, you know, if not launching rockets, launching satellites um, for communications or, you know, telecommunications or for science, um, for the environment, for looking at India from space with different types of optics. And then, of course, the other, the, the final part, I think, which we're all would love to be part of is getting humans in space. So um, that whole process, it takes a lot of resources and a lot of creative ideas and a lot of technological smarts. And I think that's what the young people of India have to offer India and not only India, the whole world. And so um, I think India is taking a great step in their space program. And uh, of course, everybody, and I think, in my own philosophy, we when we leave this planet, we leave this planet as human beings. We we generally, do, you know, sure I have a an American flag on my oops on my arm right here, but um, because I represent NASA. However, um, when I go to space, I feel like I'm a family with all of my crew members from all over the world, and uh, that's who we represent. And I I feel like we need to get everybody from all the countries of the world to cooperate in space exploration. I think we'd all be all happier a little bit with each other if we did that and uh, a little more tolerant of each other because we learn from each other that way. We we understand how different countries, different peoples, different, different environments solve problems. And, and and by golly, other other people have good solutions. <laughs> so it's really good to share all that stuff and uh, it makes us a little bit better planet. Yeah. I'm looking forward to having more Indians. Uh, once a child told me, uh, you know, that how would the passport of Earth look like when we start living on? I love that. I love that. And I, I'm going to take a related question here from uh, Mr. Kumar Gaurav uh, and uh, Kunal Gaurav. 
And Kunal Gaurav from Delhi is asking, it's a related question, with several countries including US, India, China launching Mars missions and with private companies also venturing in, what are your thoughts on state sovereignty in space? So I think the space treaty comes in handy. Yeah, yeah, that's a great question. You know, like again, I, I, Sonny Williams, I, I philosophically go back to as we leave, we sort of leave as humans. So it doesn't really matter where you're from, you're representing our planet and you, you know, human beings. Um, but competition is good also. So that's that's a great thing because um, if there's no competition, you could just sit around and think about this forever and and things won't happen. The competition create makes people really this is it's a forcing function. It's a, a fire under underneath the you know the rocket to get it going essentially. So I I'm I'm fine with that because I think what we're gonna find is we need a lot of different ideas. This isn't a, a math problem that's entirely solved. We need other people to come in with different ideas, try it out, and then we can actually learn from each other. I mean, the way to progress is taking it step by step and learning from the, the past uh, you know, successes and failures. So I think, it's, I think it's great. I think it's really good. It's gonna be a little bit of, like we mentioned before, it's a long time coming. It's gonna be, it's a hard problem to solve to actually get human beings to Mars. So every every bit of help is great. And uh, I like it. Great. I'm going to move to the next question. And this question comes from a young boy whose name is uh, Manu Thakur. And Manu Thakur is, uh, we run about 400, and Kalam Center runs about 450 Kalam libraries, which are free centers of learning all across India, especially in villages. And this boy is from one of those uh, villages in Leelapur in Gujarat. And mm -hmm. he's joining uh, his name is Manu Thakur. He's going to ask in Gujarati. I might have to translate that for you. So, okay. uh, Manu, what to you? Right. Uh, just to translate what he said, he said, Namaste Sunita Ben. My name is Manu Thakur. I am from Kalam Library, Leelapur. I want to go to the moon. What should I study? Wow, awesome. <laughs> I say, why not, right? Um, so what should you study? So, you know, when we're looking at astronauts here in, at NASA, and that's just here at NASA, we're looking for folks who have uh, backgrounds in science, technology, education, and math, right? STEM are, are the, the basics. Um, just to make sure that people understand that, you know, this is a, scientific adventure, and so you need to understand some of those scientific concepts. Um, it doesn't mean that you have to know everything about space right from the get-go, but you, we want people that we know um, that can learn these technical languages and can apply those technical concepts into operations. So what should you study? Whatever you love, <laughs> really, that is in those fields. Because if you force yourself into something, you're probably not going to be good at it. But if you love it, like I loved flying, I actually really like aerospace. I, you know, then it really makes you question and want to do your homework all the time rather than having that a struggle. So if you love it, you're going to do really well and be successful. And we want people who have been successful in the past. Um, and then we know that we have already know that we can uh, train them and, and teach them and they can do something a little bit even different that they've never done before. So, like I said, we don't really have a place to practice spacewalks for real. We have to practice in a pool. And so then we know from that that we can actually have people go out and do spacewalks and be successful, like like there was last week and going to be on Tuesday, if you have the time to watch. But um, I think study what you love, something in the sci scientific technical fields, math, engineering, any of those things will lead you into a future in the space program. Great. I think a lot of people have asked the same question. So I guess all of you are answered on this one. Uh, and I, I, the, the motto is that you should strive for excellence and uh, whatever you like, be excellent and maybe you'll get a chance to go to space and practice your excellence, whatever it is. Exactly. The next question uh, comes from Samrat Sharma. He's from Delhi and he's a space enthusiast. Over to you, Samrat. Hello, Sunita ma'am. I'm Samrat Sharma, a space enthusiast and a journalist in India's leading newspaper group. I've learned that you have spacewalk for more than 29 hours. But when you're spacewalking, even though you are tied with a harness, isn't there a fear that if you get disconnected, you will not just fall, but you fly away? Absolutely. You, yeah. Um, 
it, that of course is always in the back of your mind. <laughs> and so uh, I was talking earlier about handrails. And so, you know, you find yourself holding onto those handrails pretty tight or when your feet are in that little platform to hold your feet and you could let go with your hands, you know, there's always that second thought, do I really want to let go? Are my feet really in? Can I see them? And so we actually have on our body a secondary tether. So when you're going to go and work on something, of course, you have the what we call a safety tether, which is a long line back to the airlock. But we put on a second tether just to make sure and it's right in front of you so you can see. Now, if worse comes to worse, maybe you thought you put it on and you didn't um, and you potentially did fly away. We have a little jet pack. It's called Safer that we have on the back of our life support system. And we trained, we have a little hand controller and we're able to potentially fly ourselves back. There's only a limited bottle about this big of nitrogen in which you are actually have the, uh, you know, some form of gas to fly yourself back. Um, so nobody has done it for real. We've practiced it inside of the shuttle payload bay, just to proof of concept to make sure it does work. Um, but we practice here on earth in a virtual reality lab where we wear virtual reality goggles and we're on the space station and we simulate that we get tossed off and then we have to take the hand controller out and fly ourselves back. It's really scary. It's you're sitting in a chair at a desk and you can be sweating like crazy because like you can come like within this far of the space station and your hand just cannot reach and you'll, and you'll just float by. Um, so you really want to perfect this skill. And we don't practice it like on a daily basis. We only practice it maybe on a monthly basis because, you know, if this happens to you, this goes back to one of the other questions about, you know, like how do you train for these types of things? If this happens to you, you want to be really good at it instantaneously. So every month you just have to whoop, remember how to do this and, and fly back. So we do do a little bit of training on the space station as well just to get queued up again right before our spacewalk. Um, but like I, like I said, Luckily, no one's ever had to do it, um, and it makes you really think about holding on and making sure you have a good handhold or a good tether before you let go of your hands. I think they, they only showed it in a fiction. The movie Gravity showed this. Yes, uh, exactly. <laughs> exactly. I remember that. That was a scary part of the movie. The mm -hmm. next question comes from Vaishnavi Sinha. She's, uh, she's into content writing, and she's from joining us from Delhi. Vaishnavi, over to you. Hi. Since you're an inspiration to a lot of women and students out there, are there any words of encouragement that you would like to offer to any aspiring astronauts? Great question. You know, um, uh, you know, I have a young niece and we were just talking about, uh, you know, life in general. And I, I was mentioning to her, you know, um, you're going to feel a little interesting and she's, she's a young teenager. So you're going to, you're going to go through these periods in time where you, you're going to doubt yourself. I mean, I think we all doubt ourselves. Um, but you have to just put your head down and do the best that you can and then be confident in yourself that, you know, that at the end of the day that you did the best that you could do. Um, I mentioned earlier, find things that you love and you will do them very well. You might find yourself, particularly as a young lady or a woman in a class, particularly in a technical class, maybe one or two of you and a class of 20 or 40 uh, young men around you. Uh, don't let that bother you. Don't let that distract you. You know, if you, ha if you have the right to sit in that seat and, and take that class, then you have the right to be there with, with all of those young men around you. Um, I was very lucky. I, I think I had a very good support structure. Um, my brother was a great influence on me and, you know, never cut me any slack and pushed me. Um, my husband also the same way, very uh, supportive and always said, Sonny, you know, you, you, you do your best and you can, you can compete with the people all around you. So I think my one piece of in encouragement advice is, you know, don't doubt yourself if you have the skills and uh, don't limit yourself just because of what other people around you say. If you have the qualifications, if you take the effort and do well, um, don't let anybody limit you um, and don't let yourself limit yourself. Great, wonderful advice. And I think a lot of girls were asking this question. I think that applies to all of you. The next question we are taking uh, these questions from the live comments which are happening. It comes from uh, a young boy from Australia. He's 13 years old, his name is Vedant. And he's asking, the exact thoughts, you're asking the exact thoughts and preparation you had in mind before you stepped out for the spacewalk. 
Wow. Um, so the biggest thing uh, I think the thought was making sure my suit was all squared away, making sure my partner's suit is all squared away. You know, we go out on a spacewalk with two people. And the reason we do that is because the other person is your rescue person. So if anything happens to you, like, the suit is its own spacecraft. And so it has its own life support system, like I mentioned before. And so it is, it could fail. It could have some problems in the past. We've had water coming inside of the helmet and you're, and you're, the other spacewalker is the rescuer. Um, so the other, when that happened, the other, the second spacewalker helped the first spacewalker into the airlock to get safe and be okay. So my exact thoughts were, as I was going outside, is my spacesuit okay? Where is my partner? Is his spacesuit okay? And then we went on and, and started working. Um, and I will say though, it took a little while. I think I mentioned this already. It took a little while, but as the sun came up, I think some of those thoughts, I got a little bit comfortable outside. Some of those thoughts went away because there was the planet right below you. And I think mm -hmm. th at that moment in time was like, whoa, I remember where I am. <laughs> Not only about my space suit and about my partner, but like in the bigger scope of things, like, wow, I am outside of this International Space Station orbiting around the Earth at 17,000 miles an hour. <laughs> I'm like, this is this is surreal. This is unbelievable. And even today, sometimes I think about that. And I was like, was that really me? <laughs> but my exact thoughts seriously were like, first, technical, making sure everything was okay, squared away and correct. And secondly, just looking at, you know, the amazing surroundings where you are. How can you not take a moment to look at our planet? Pretty spectacular. Fabulous. I think great thoughts. Uh, I, I'm sure that the whole feeling was so surreal. The next question is, again, we are picking from the live comments which are coming in. Uh, it is from K.N. Sai Sukumar. He's a 15-year-old boy from Hyderabad. And his question is, did you hear any sound when you were in space? Are there some, uh, this vacuum, right? Yeah, so, uh, yeah. Do you hear anything? It's a very interesting uh, question because, you know, of course, there's sound needs air for uh, to transmit, right? And so... Um, so you have a headset on and you can hear each other talking and we hear, you know, mission control talking to us and the folks inside the space station talking to us. Um, but at one point in time, it was so funny. Uh, I was outside and I was had my hand on one of those handrails and that handrail is connected to part of the space station, a canister actually. And inside that canister was a platform and on, on it sat a motor and that motor was the thing that drove the solar arrays to extend or retract. We were having a little bit of a problem with this ex uh, retraction of the solar arrays, so um, they were trying to try trying it a number of times. And each time you do this, you try it. It's somebody on the inside of the space station hitting a button on a computer, which drives that motor, which will turn that motor on and drive. And it was funny because I'm stand I'm standing floating out there, <laughs> holding onto this handrail, and uh, I could hear when the motor started. And I came back in after the spacewalk and I said, oh, I, I, I heard that you guys, you know, tried the motor a number of times and we were having this problem. And they're like, what are you talking about? You can't hear out there. And that was, and so it made me stop and think like, oh, maybe I was just hearing something in my spacesuit. But actually, you know, sound is a vibration, like I mentioned, right? And it usually is a medium, the medium is air here on earth where we listen through it, but it can just be a vibration. And that's how your ear picks it up. So that motor was connected to the platform, which could, which was connected to this, the, the canister, which was connected to the handrail, and my hand was on that handrail. So it was actually picking up that vibration from the motor and then being registered in my ear as a sound. So it made me really stop and think about sound and how sound is actually transmitted. Very interesting. So, um, so to answer your to, a long answer to your short question, just in space, no, you're not going to hear things, but if you if you are touching something, you're going to hear because of its vibration. I'll move on to the next question. It's coming from Chennai in South India. And as a science graduate, a uh, science student actually, uh, her name is Benita, and uh, she's going to ask a question. Probably in Tamil, I'll have to translate that to you. Uh, Benita, over to you. <laughs> So she's, uh, she's asking, uh, what did you miss most about space when you came back to Earth? 
Oh, wow. That's uh, sort of an opposite question. People always ask, like, what do you miss about Earth when you're in space? So what do I miss about space when I'm here on Earth? Wow, there's a whole lot. Um, first of all, I have to actually brush my hair here on Earth. <laughs> in space, and then it's a life of its own, which was sort of cool. Um, I just wake up every morning and look at myself and be shocked. It was fun. Uh, but that's all joking aside. You know what I miss about uh, being in space is actually really having that perspective of, of looking at our planet and really um, trying to uh, really relay that perspective to other people. Here on Earth, you can talk about it a lot, right? Of like, oh, it's amazing. It's beautiful. But in space, I think we're a little bit more compelling um, when we can really bring that story back home and, 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 and talk to people from space. Um, now, the fun parts about space, I just really miss um, floating, actually. It's such a unique experience. I mean, you I look at a room like the one I'm in right now and the ceiling, and I think like there was so much room in here to float around, and it would be so much fun. I wish everybody had that opportunity. Um, if you look at the room where you are right now and think about think about it, how cool it would be if you could fly around in that room or even or outside, you know, even better. If you are outside and like I look at a, a bird, you know, nowadays and how they sometimes when there's a lot of trees, they fly between the between the branches and land on a you know small branch. I think, well, that's a pretty cool trait and characteristic that they have. I, I wish we could do that on a daily basis because I know it's fun. <laughs> I'm, I'm glad, I'm glad. I'm sure there's a lot of things to miss uh, from space. And it's a fantastic space, space to be at. So that's the uh, title, Our Place in Space. Yep. So that's the place <laughs> I want to miss. Uh, the last question comes from uh, a science graduate, Preksha, Preksha Setia. And uh, she's going to ask you a question. Preksha, over to you. Uh, hello, ma'am. My question to you is, uh, how does... Um, body feels in microgravity like what changes you feel when you are in space as compared to when you are on earth oh great like question yeah great question so there there are you know if you if you ignored it you would probably not realize it you know unless it, things were very obvious but um but your your body does automatically change like if you guys see my face right here now you you see pictures of me in space. I look like I'm a little chubbier because, uh, you know, obviously there's a, a fluid shift. And so everybody's face gets a little bit more rounder, which is nice because some of the little wrinkles will go away. <laughs> but it's only temporarily. Um, but that's like that's immediate. And what comes with that is a little bit of a headache, a little bit of a feeling of stuffed in your stuffed up in your sinuses. So a lot of people sound a little bit different. Their voices sound a little bit different right from the get go. Um, another thing along with that fluid shift and the way your body reacts is um, your spine expands a little bit um, because here on earth, your head is sitting on top of your spinal cord, which is pushing down because of gravity. Uh, on, in space, there's no, nothing pushing down, so your spine expands. And you get a little bit taller. It takes a little while, but you get a little bit taller while you're up there. Um, also, what that does is, is stretch those muscles on your back so people have a little bit of back irritation for a while until you get used to it. And then like some of the quiet, interesting things are you're not walking around. Like my tennis shoes from running were nice and clean. I only wore them really to be on the treadmill or on the exercise equipment. Other than that, we float around in socks or bare feet. And so your feet don't get used. And so all the little calluses on your feet from Walking here on Earth, those all go away. You have nice, soft baby feet again. Um, I noticed that my fingernails grew very fast. I'm not really sure why. So we had to, you know, you have to figure out a way to clip your fingernails. I had a tape right next door as I was clipping because these, these little nails get really sharp when you clip them, and you don't want it going into somebody's eye floating around. Uh, so those are all little little things like that. Um, you know, even even the silly things about like going to the bathroom, you have to get used to. Going to the bathroom here on Earth, gravity helps a little bit of that too. <laughs> so um, you have to use your abdominal muscles a little bit more on, in space than you would here on Earth, which which is fine. makes you makes you a little bit more in shape. So um, there's a bunch of little small changes like that, and then psychologically, uh, I think I think you get super comfortable with living in a different environment. I mean, I I was my first flight was six and a half months, and I was like, wow. Um, I can't remember what it's like to walk. 
um, you know, what is it like to have to get up and, and, you know, get in a car to go to work? You know, it's all interesting stuff. What, what is it like to put stuff down on a table and it stays there? You know, those little things like that, I couldn't even really imagine because I had not lived like that for such a long time. So your, your, your whole being can change while you're up there. And uh, like it, you just automatically trend and adopt, adapt that way. But if you take note of those types of little things that are different from Earth, you'll realize there's quite a few things that are that changes with your within yourself and you know, including your mind. Thank you, Preksha, for your question, and that's a wonderful answer. I, I think we all sort of uh, through you, we have uh, in a way lived in space, so I can imagine how anybody <laughs> could be. Be, if I were to be in space. Uh, once again, I, at the end of the day, we have already taken 15 extra minutes from you. I really, uh, from the bottom of my heart, thank you, uh, Sunita Williams ji. Uh, it's a fabulous opportunity. We have tried to take all the questions uh, in a sort of a nutshell, so because some of the questions were in the same questions were answered by many people. So they have been all answered. And those who are not answered, we will answer them separately offline. We'll do that. Uh, but thank you again for your time. It's, it's a fabulous opportunity to talk to you, to understand you. And uh, the way you were able to communicate space to us who have been always at Earth, I think it was like a movie. I could imagine it all in Once again, thank you for your time. Well, thank you, for, thank you so much to the Kalam Center for giving me this opportunity to talk to all the students and people in India and around the world who are tuning in. Um, really, uh, space exploration is um, our future. It's what we're destined to do. And, uh, you know, I'm loved that I'm able to share it. And I'm hopefully I've been able to influence a couple of people here and there to get involved because it's pretty awesome. Um, take care, everybody. And thank you so much again for the opportunity. Thank you. Namaste. Namaste. I stopped the camp. Should I?